I'm not going to end up in the closet smiling like that Canadian admiral. I just want to point out, though, he was a Canadian Navy admiral, so <laughs> combat skills might be compromised a bit. Remember when we first met John McClain? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we love when growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, and alongside me are two more. The first one being Big D, Dick Hebert. Good evening. And Gene Lyons. Gene Lyons, stiff-ass Brit. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films from the 80s and 90s, our childhood, still hold up. Each week, you, the audience, select from four movie choices that we then break out our race car VHS tape rewinders and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of each podcast, the three of us will provide you, the audience, with a number of wipes each movie would need to take to get off of your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on social media. We're at Shat the Movies, and if you're there... Uh, please share with a friend and leave a five-star review. This week, Big D was uh, Pierce Brosnan movies, right? I almost wish it was. I think, did Marty suggest this category? Yeah, this was another Great Northern Radio, our buddy uh, Marty, who's been sending us pictures of his Westworld shirts that, that we finally got around to sending to him. Yeah, so he wanted us to do James Bond movies. Uh, the Living Daylights, For Your Eyes Only, A View to a Kill, and the ultimate winner, which was the 1995 Golden Eye. Yeah, I, I don't really remember the Timothy Dalton years at all, but I think one of the movies is actually pretty, like, it's renowned as one of the best, right? Is that the one that has the, the semi truck that goes on, like, all the wheels and then, like, a missile fires under it? Which one is that? I don't think you could tell any of these apart. I, I don't, <laughs> That's right. If I said to you, hey, it's the one where the rocket comes out and there's a car chase and then he bangs some chick, he sexually harasses two others, uh, and then they set him up at some ultra over complex Rube Goldberg machine that's going to attempt to kill him. It could be any of them. Two words for you on View to a Kill. Grace Jones. That's what set ah, it apart. That's right. Yeah. 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 You know what set Goldeneye apart? The N64 video game. Fact. Very true. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, the first Bond for me was Pierce Brosnan, so to speak. Like, that's, what, you know, when I was really into movies and uh, it was right around the time that Pierce Brosnan became Bond. Now I have uh, completely disavowed Pierce Brosnan in exchange for a more grounded, realistic, gritty Bond with uh, Daniel Craig, uh, who will be forever my Bond. Yeah, for me, my favorite Bond is, is always going to be Sean Connery because he was just the dick Bond. I mean, like he he had the most dick lines. And so he gave Bond that swagger and that panache that I that I really enjoyed. But as far as a realistic and action packed, you know, believable Bond. Yeah, Daniel Craig is is I, I love how they took it to a dark and somber place. Uh, that is not what we watched this week, though. <laughs> A 1995 action-adventure thriller when a powerful satellite system falls into the hands of Alec Trevelyan, also known as Agent 006, played by Sean Bean, a former ally-turned-enemy, only James Bond, played by Pierce Brosnan, can save the world from an awesome space weapon that, in one short pulse, could destroy the Earth. As Bond squares off against his former compatriot, he also battles Alec's stunning ally, Xenia Onatop, played by Famke Janssen, an assassin who uses pleasure. As her ultimate weapon. Guys, where were you when Goldeneye debuted? I honestly don't remember the movie coming out. I just remember the video game. Freshman year at Manzanita Hall at Arizona State University. The entire floor would get together. We would skip classes, in between classes. Everyone would be playing the multiplayer. Only the multiplayer part of the game. So shout out to Matt Hodges, Ryan Swank, Colin McKay, and the rest of the 8th floor at Manzanita Hall. What? Yeah, Rod, you always ask at the beginning of the podcast if you can remember what Blockbuster is. I'm going to take our younger listeners back to a darker day in video games where there was no online multiplayer. If you want to play a multiplayer game with your friends, they actually had to physically come over to your house and sit on the couch next to you and play. I'd argue we're in darker times now, though, because I like playing local multiplayer 
And it'd be cool to just get to hang out with people and play, but all the games are now only online. So you got to like tell, it's like, I got to tell Raj to go home so we can play together. Yeah, that's true. I, I agree. That does suck. But yeah, the Nintendo 64, they came out with a GoldenEye game. And the, the regular mission part was pretty good, but the same couch multiplayer experience was what they called it. it. It was what set it aside. It was the precursor to today's Call of Duty, uh, you know, even Battlefield or uh, what's the one you guys always play? There's the Battlefield Division? 1, Battlefront, The Division. Oh, yeah, Battlefront, yeah. That multiplayer component wasn't planned for the game. The actual game designer, Steve Ellis, he added that in with a month left. He just saw he had some time, said, hey, I think this would be a kick-ass feature, and snuck it in without Rare, who was the uh, producer with Nintendo, or letting Nintendo know. And the first time that either of those had seen it was when they rolled the game out. And I got to tell you, thank you, thank you very much, Steve, because when I was in the military, this was our lunch every day. Five or six guys who were tactically proficient, breaking out their grenade launchers and hitting the temple level. Um, I know this is going to sound strange. I didn't actually play the game all that much. I actually watched the movie more than I played the game because this is the first Bond movie I ever saw in the theaters. Uh, this was like another Roger date night where we, we'd we go to Chili's, have some queso dip, watch Bond, and then have like uh, disappointing coitus. Uh, Painful spa sex. <laughs> But I remember loving how like cool Pierce Brosnan seemed at the time. Looking back now, I'm glad they went darker in the franchise because uh, this was basically Austin Powers. Right. Austin Powers came out two years after this movie, and there's no way to think it wasn't a backlash against basically where Bond has become a caricature of himself and using all the which which we'll get to a lot of these points. But I think the chief one Big D and I agree on is just is just is just kill the guy. Like and and I think it was beautifully put by Seth Green in in the classic scene from Austin Powers, where he's just like, "Just give me the gun, I'll just kill him right here," you know. <laughs> yeah, well, the one thing that that isn't cheesy, it's the sexiness of the Bond girls and the, and the naked silhouettes in the beginning. But uh, who are your sexiest Bond girls of all time? Like of all the movies you've watched, who ranks at the highest? I, I think Halle Berry is up there as Jinx. She was different. She was. She, even today, she's gorgeous. So I, I think she's there, but my favorite by far is uh, Sophie. I think it's Marcaro. I think it's how she pronounces Mar- Marceau. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so my favorite is Sophie Marceau. She's a French actress. She played Electra King in The World Is Not Enough. Most people won't probably know the name, but Google it. She's, I think, one of the most traditionally beautiful of all the Bond girls. Yeah, for me, I agree on the Halle Berry thing. The cool thing with the Halle Berry thing was that swimsuit, man. The swimsuit with the knife attached to it was like total 60s throwback, super hot swimsuit. She had the pixie cut, everything going on. But for me, coincidentally, it was Famke from GoldenEye. She, I mean, for me, again, this is the gene recipe. She's got black leather. she got thighs that can crush a man to death. That outfit she had in the end when she repelled out of the helicopter, uh, she's just fantastic. It, and deriving pleasure from sadism, good God. Yeah, I think that's what I was going to say. It was a sadism. She's getting off as she's shooting people. Well, yeah, she she is moaning every time she like she sees violence or witnesses violence. Correct. And like, and it's so hot that even though the audio doesn't quite match up, I'm not complaining. Yeah. Uh, for me, I know who it's not, and that's Denise Richards. I thought she was the worst Bond girl of all times. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. She was on the Howard Stern show. And the guys were, were like, no, her I know. I think I think they sent out like uh, they sent out one of the guys to interview her at a, at a premiere, and they said, oh, "Yo, right. was it hard? Was it hard being in Bond?" And she she bit on it. She thought it was a legit question. She goes, "No, it wasn't that bad." Said, was it hard to play a doctor and act like you were smart? <laughs> she, she was. She's unwatchable. That's the that's the opposite end. She's a five white Bond girl. I think the end of the movie says uh, Christmas comes twice this year or something like that. Like, that's it's so yeah. bad. Gross. <laughs> it's terrible. Well, Big D, play the trailer of GoldenEye. When the world is the target. 72 hours ago, a secret weapon system was detonated over Saturn Island. And the threat is real. GoldenEye exists. A radiation surge that destroys everything with an electronic circuit. You can still depend on one man. I want you to find Goldeneye. Three. Find who took it. Two. And stop it. One.
name's Bond. James Bond. The world's most famous secret agent is back. We aim to please. And this time, 007 is facing the ultimate enemy. The man who knows him best. Hello, James. What an unpleasant surprise. 006. What's the matter? No pithy comeback? He was your friend. And now he's your enemy and you will kill him. Is the satellite in range? Target is London. Now, the entire world is about to be caught in the crossfire. See you in hell, James. You first. Kill him. The pleasure will be all mine. Did you check her out? Ah! Ah! to tell. Three clicks, arms the fuse. Don't say it. The writing's on the wall. Grow up, double O seven. I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War. You know, James, I was always better. Both of you, stop it. You like boys with toys. The trick is to quit while you're still here. I wouldn't think of it. Charming, sophisticated secret agent. Shaken, but not disturbed. <laughs> Get us out of here. Bond, only Bond. The man just won't take a hint. I need the gun. That depends on your definition of safe sex. On November 17th... Grab it! United Artists brings you... Trust me. James Bond. Why can't you just be a good boy and die? That's one trick I've never learned. It's 1986, and MI6 agents James Bond and Alex Trevelyan infiltrate a secret Soviet chemical weapons production facility with the intention of destroying it. After finding their target, a large room filled with chemical canisters, they plant their explosives. Unfortunately, Alec is captured and gunned down by Colonel Arumov. Arum? Or, 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 I, I, I'm terrible with Russian names. Arumov. Arumov. Bond escapes the facility, then using a motorcycle to leap after a plane that falls off a nearby cliff, he successfully regains control of the plane and flies off as the weapons plant explodes. So the movie starts off with bungee jumping. Now, it's supposed to be 1986. Bungee jumping is about as 1995 as it gets, right? Like, that was the thing in the 90s. Everybody's bungee jumping. So the movie starts out with this bungee jumping scene. This was voted the best movie stunt of all time in a 2002 Sky Movies poll. I was not that impressed with it. I kind of thought it was a slow start, honestly. Uh, if you are interested in doing it, by the way, for 125 pounds, it's actually in Switzerland at a place called Contradam. You can do it. But I, I saw this scene and I thought, okay, this, certainly this can't be like, it's, it's going to get much better from here. Really didn't. I don't understand how you wouldn't swing back into the dam and, and hurt yourself. That doesn't make any sense. No, to no, me. you you can do you it. Can? No, you can. No, hold on, hold on, it. hold yeah. on. People do it all the yes, time. If you go bungee a dam, they have a rig set up that okay. takes the cord and actually puts it about ten feet away from the wall. Bond just attached the bungee cord to the edge of the wall. Yeah. So there's no gap between him and the wall. He would have hit and scraped the entire way down. No, that's what the uh, that's what the gun was for, the cable gun. No, the gun was to stop him at the bottom so he didn't bounce back up. But he still would have hit the wall going down. This podcast, I'm probably going to be tearing apart problems with the the realism of the movie. Today, we're more accustomed to you know the bond of of Daniel Craig, who's grounded and real and gritty, and it's that Batman. It's that that shift we had from typical Hollywood action movies to something that we could believe in. And I think this movie was the complete opposite end of the spectrum. I mean, one of my problems is, and again, it's going to sound stupid, I don't like when you have uh, foreign agents, terrorists, speaking a different language, but they don't bother to actually have them speak the language. Instead, we get the colonel shouting orders at his men in English. What the fuck? You're, you're a Russian soldier. You speak Russian. I started to think, what movies have I seen do it successful? And I thought of Inglorious Bastards. You have that opening scene with Hans where he's interrogating the farmer. He switches from English to German to French. If you don't do that, it immediately pulls me out of the scene. And I know I'm watching a movie. 
Let's also talk about the fact that there's not a great deal of complexity of dialogue there. If there's a guy yelling at guys in Russian and they're shooting at Bond, I get what he's yelling. I don't need it translated. Well, you talk about like the idea of wanting your action scenes grounded in realism. You know, people went to Bond movies, I think in like the, the 60s and the 70s, and even in the early 80s to be wowed. They wanted to see action sequences that they couldn't ever see, right? It was over the top action. Today, you've got movies like The Fast and the Furious, which have taken that Bond formula and executed it at a much higher level. No, there's two different types of, of meal we're having here. There is the Fast and the Furious, which is junk food. It is a 7-Eleven hot dog. It is garbage over the top. Hold on. We never expect it to be real. You can have Toretto kicking a torpedo that's going on the top of a frozen lake launched by a submarine, and people don't bat an eye. But with James Bond, you expect something different. When was the, What was the last Fast and the Furious movie you saw? They all blur together. I don't know. Wh- which one? Uh, it, they were driving cars really fast out of buildings. All right. Uh, it was the one before Paul Walker died. What, oh, okay. All right. Was The Rock in it? What, the one where they're in Puerto Rico pretending to be Brazil and dragging a 40,000-pound safe behind cars down the middle of the street? You're telling me that scene's not better than Pierce Brosnan picking up a, a motorcycle and driving off a cliff? You're not... that. I believe that more than I believe what he does here with this full fucking, you know, pulling out of a nosedive. You know, here's my point. There's a difference between the 70s Batman TV show and, you know, Christian Bale in The Dark Knight. One of them is grounded in realism. I expect that from Bond, and I think people do. I'd counter that the very existence of Q tells you that Bond is not grounded in realism. You got belts that shoot cables, you got laser watches, you got grenade pins, cars that shoot missiles, people like uh, people who escape on a submarines that are that are disguised as icebergs. Like, come on, this is not a real. It's certainly different, but I wouldn't say that anyone is more realistic than the other. Um, now, currently, the, now certainly the current Bond is far more realistic, but these Bond, I mean, this era of Bond, no way, it was total schlock. I think it was total schlock because of the way that Bond escapes out of this scene. Is total, like what? I, I looked at the screen, I was like, come on. And I was alone. Exactly. He shoots down one of the gates that is holding what looks like kegs filled with nerve agent. They don't just cause an avalanche of, of barrels on top of the Russian shoulders. It shoots them out like somebody had kicked a vending machine in college and it starts shooting out soda cans. It was ridiculous. It was okay to look at, but come on. No, wait wait, wait a minute. The whole scene before that, he escapes because he he's like hiding behind a whole rack of gas canisters. And the Russian guy is like, no, don't shoot. You blow us all up, you idiot. And like shoots one of his guys for like taking a shot. What happened to all the bullets before that, though? They were being extremely liberal with the way that they were shooting their AK-47s. They were just spraying that fucking room. I'm still trying to figure out if your Russian accent is more French or if it's more brownies <laughs> from Willow. What the hell was that? That I was only, a brownie. I only do French fairies. Yeah, but for me, I don't know how they voted that bungee jumping scene as one of the memorable. That airplane scene is preposterous. Did you guys have a problem with catching up to a moving airplane going off of a cliff, but yet his human body is fast enough to catch up to it? I totally did. I hated it. I thought I hated like uh, in a couple movies when he's parasailing on a giant wave. I thought I hated that scene. No, I hated this scene more. But let me ask you this. Is there anything better than 1990s like depiction of the Internet? Oh, no, it was wonderful. I mean, first of all, email. Apparently for email to send, you have to be typing the whole time. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Apparently. uh, Also, there's just like graphics that just show up randomly and everything requires, you know, some sort of emoji that indicates who you are, some sort of avatar on the screen. Uh, Nowhere was it better done than in Hackers, but this is pretty damn good. I halfway expected uh, Nedry to pop up from Jurassic Park and go, ah, 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 ah. And of course, coding in, in 1995 apparently was just passwords. That's yeah, all but, coding was. Yeah. This was also the era of like where coders, like they were constantly uh, sexually harassing their coworkers, which apparently is okay if you're James Bond. Oh, without a doubt. James can do whatever he wants. We see that throughout the movies. Well, nine years later in Monte Carlo, Bond follows Zinnia Onatop, a member of the Janus crime syndicate now, who has formed a suspicious relationship with Charles Farrell, a Canadian Navy admiral. As Onatop crushes the admiral to death with her thighs during sex, 
His credentials are stolen by Oromov, who uses them to board a French Navy destroyer with Onatop to steal a Eurocopter Tiger helicopter. Oromov and Onatop later fly the helicopter to a bunker in Siberia, where they massacre the staff and steal the control disc for GoldenEye, an electromagnetic Soviet satellite weapon from the Cold War. They program GoldenEye to destroy the complex and escape with programmer Boris Krishnikov. Natalia Simonova, the lone survivor, contacts Boris and arranges to meet him in St. Petersburg, where he betrays her to Janice. So, Raj, you talked about the whole Boris character, and I felt this was the biggest travesty of the movie, is that they had Alan Cumming in the cast, and I don't know if it was his performance or the way he was written, but, I mean, Alan Cumming was an X-Men, burlesque, The Tempest, The Anniversary Party, just brilliant performances in all of these. He's enigmatic, he's charismatic, and they had him play a cliched Russian hacker who sexually harasses coworkers and has just catchphrases. It reminded me of if you took a character out of the Big Bang and then threw him into an action movie. It, it pissed me off. It was embarrassing for Alan Cumming. Yeah, I imagine he's in a military installation. He has to have some kind of clearance. I don't know how that shit would fly. But the performances didn't bother me as much as the special effects. Have you guys seen the Spies Like Us? Yes. Yeah, of course. Was this the same satellite that was used for GoldenEye? I'm convinced it's made of PVC piping like you'd get at Home Depot. On the ends, you have the threaded part that you screw it on. And I don't know of any satellites that are currently encased in orbit in some kind of giant shell. I imagine that getting it into space would be prohibitive by the weight. But okay, I'll go with it. GoldenEye's got a shield. You hit a button, it opens up. Well, I kind of wondered about that, but I thought it's it's probable in the sense that they didn't want anybody to know it existed. So maybe it was masked as something else. And then when the things popped off, then you saw what it really was. Okay. And then it's got little baby solar panels. They look like little bees wings. It wasn't even like legitimately large enough to get any kind of power. But Roger mentioned how in the in the early 90s, hacking computers, it was all new to everybody. At this point, did you know what an EMP was or what it would look like? Because they display an EMP strike as like a lightning strike. In the 90s, did we think that's what it was? Well, I was aware of what an EMP was, but I didn't know what it would look like. And so I, I, I thought, though, the whole point of the EMP strike was that you wouldn't cause damage to personnel. It was only supposed to damage electrical components. So it seemed really odd that it was like, oh, God, you could kill all these people and there's shit exploding everywhere. You know, she's and Natalia's diving for her life. I didn't know what an EMP was, but I knew what EMF was, and it was unbelievable. <laughs> Shut up. Wow. So... So I, I want to talk about another, again, I want to focus on some of these character issues here. I had a real problem with the Xenia character. Now, I loved the bedroom Xenia, right? That was great. But on a top first appears in the casino. She looks great, but she's got this clever, coy casino persona where she's playing kind of a classy lady. And then it was completely betrayed by her behavior everywhere else in the movie. So this isn't a case of a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. But it's more like a bad pun Dorcas in the casino, and then a sex beast <laughs> below deck. She felt unreal, silly. It felt like they just wrote the character to fit whatever lines they wanted her to say and the thigh-crushing thing. It's as almost if her name was a like a sexual innuendo. Like, a, you know what I mean? No, no, her first appearance was in that bad race before they get to the casino. Can we talk about how Michael Bay that shit was? Okay, so yeah, the race is awful. Besides the fact that Bond is putting... Any other motorist's lives in danger. He almost runs over an entire pack of cyclists who then comically fall like dominoes. This entire time, he is sexually harassing what we learn later is a co-worker there to evaluate him. Was this okay? Did this fly in the 90s? Are you telling me you never take your HR women out on, uh, on you know back roads and, and drive way too fast? The problem with this scene is they're doing what I call the Michael Bay treatment. You have, you have one problem? No, multiple problems. No, listen, the, my main problem, how's that? My main problem with this is that they're giving it the Michael Bay treatment where they're unnecessarily throwing in obstacles. Like, oh, here's the same road. Let's, let's have a tractor, you know, carrying hay. And then uh, two miles later, here's some fucking cyclists. Meanwhile, there's no other fucking cars. Had they put other cars on the road... I would have been fearful. I would have been excited. Oh, shit, there's other cars on a mountain road. So you were okay with the custom 
form-fitted champagne cooler in the center yeah. console of his oh, gun. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, you don't have that? Oh, I liked it with the porn music in the background. Not even from a good porno, just from like a like a terrible, you know, uh, 1980s USA up all night porno music in the background. That's that's what I really enjoyed. Talk about pornos. On the top's finishing move. Yeah. The, the, the scissor squeeze around the torso. Mm. We all watch enough MMA to know... If somebody does that to me, I'm punching her in the face. Really? I'm beating. Yes. As soon as I realize that she's trying to kill me, I'm not going to end up in the closet smiling like that Canadian admiral. I just want to point out, though, he was a Canadian Navy admiral. So <laughs> combat skills might be compromised a bit. Uh, uh, if you're Canadian, right in. The other thing is, like, I, I get that Baccarat is like the game that James Bond is known for playing in the you know in in all the the movies prior to this does anyone know how to fucking play baccarat I, I get that they were trying to like do some interplay some flirting in between but as they're laying down the cards I'm like ah, w- w- what's happening here yeah those cards don't even have numbers on them how the hell are you supposed to figure out what's going on <laughs> I was impressed by the spatula guy the guy who can quickly yeah. like slide it under and flip them if he makes a mistake that's like a two hundred thousand dollar hand. But he is doing that with some confidence. I want to watch him at Benihana flipping my my onion volcano. Getting back to the uh, the Navy Admiral, I feel bad now actually because he seemed like a really nice guy. Like he seemed like he's Hold getting on. crushed, and he's like, "Ah, uh, Zinia, you're killing me. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> dying." <laughs> would, would you mind not doing that, Zinia? Oh my goodness, like, that it, feels so good. Oh, and at first, don't uh, don't stop. You know, <laughs> we're, like we went to Minnesota for some reason with the Fergo. If, at first, I'm like, she's kind of like sexy with the sadism, but at some point, she's just like playing with his chest hair, and then she like just slaps him in the face and like rubs around his. I'm like, this is weird, but you know, again, maybe that's his jam. And where was and where exactly was Oromov during the sex? He was just hiding in the closet watching, because you see the the credentials get like swiped while the fucking is still going on. That's that's Oromov's thing. He likes to watch. Uh, well, it's London. And M assigns Bond to investigate the attack. He flies to St. Petersburg to meet CIA operative Jack Wade, who suggests that Bond meet with Valentin Zukovsky, a former KGB agent and business rival of Janus. Zukovsky arranges a meeting between Bond and Janus. On the top surprises Bond at the Grand Hotel Europe and attempts to kill him, but he overpowers her. He takes Bond to Janus, who reveals himself as Trevelyan. He faked his death in Siberia, but was badly scarred by the explosion a descendant of the Cossack clans who collaborated with the Nazi forces during the Second World War, Trevelyan has vowed revenge against the British after they betrayed the Cossacks, which drove his father to kill Alec's mother and himself. Just as Bond is about to tr- shoot Alec, Bond is shot with a tranquilizer dart. Yeah, so I'm thinking about it now, and I'm going to agree with you guys. I do want my Bond to be grounded in reality, but at the same time, I'm okay with Q and his dangerous hijinks. Whenever you go down into his lab, you don't know what you're going to find. You could find a, a cast that shoots a, a rocket, an exploding pen. You, you can find absolutely anything. There is no safety protocol in that entire... They're just launching grenades. They're sh- they almost kill four or five techs. There's no way that I would work in there without full body armor. No, but, but one of the things I did like that kind of brought us right back was the second that Judy Dench hit the screen. To me, the movie took a turn for the better. Right. So Judy Dench symbolizes the rise of feminism in this movie, and you could tell that Bond doesn't like her, but this was a stab that they were taking at modernizing the outfit. I think she was speaking for the audience when she says, I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. Um, She prefers bourbon to cognac because she's a goddamn boss. Like, this is showing a powerful woman who is not going to be seduced by Bond, who doesn't give a shit about his antics. And although she wishes him well, like, it it is almost signaling from the series that they are taking a different turn, that this is going to, that he's an evolving character now, that they're, they're, you know, and then they just continue with the same bullshit for another hour. Bond is by far the worst secret agent of all time, though, right? Everyone knows He's a spy. Who doesn't know that he's a spy? But it's not just like the fact that like he's hiding in plain sight. It, 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 it defeats the purpose of like using like code names and secret phrases. But then he's just making tactically terrible decisions. He's in the bottom of a of a swimming pool that's abandoned. There's no one else around. He's closing his eyes and just floating there. 
If I was an assassin, that's the first place I'm going to go down and try and kill him. And, and I could make it look like an accident very easily. This guy has obviously no idea what he's doing. So that spa scene, you know, every Bond movie's got its classic sex scene. Like, he'll have sex with lots of people, but there's the one that's like the the really sexy scene. This one was interesting because there wasn't actually any sex at all. It started out kind of sexy. Uh, she's on the ground. He's got the gun trained on her, but then they get close to each other, which, again, tactically idiotic. Like, you know this woman is from a crime syndicate. You let her get that close to you. You don't know if she's armed at all. Anyway, so I alternated from thinking it was sexy to cheesy and then back to sexy. I decided on sexy. Uh, my favorite part of the whole thing is he sits Xenia's ass on that steam grate and like burns her, and then flips her like a rag doll onto onto you know tile essentially. Pulls a gun on her, and then you know next thing he's got the upper hand. But but man, she was. I mean, she looked good in this scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know Roger and I traditionally, whenever we're in a bathhouse situation, mm-hmm. our guard is always up. We're we're ready. That's not the only thing that's always up. (laughs) There's some random dude, obviously some other henchman in the back, who's just kind of faceless in there, and Bond takes care of him too. But besides having all these faceless characters... Bond takes care of everyone in the bathhouses. (laughs) He does. That's how he gets his information. Not only that, he gave him a fucking facial. (laughs) He did. He, He did, he did. We always have those faceless men, but we also have the typical meathead portrayal of the americans oh this guy is my favorite are you kidding cia operative jack wade at first i thought they were making fun of american cia like i was like oh you know british people making fun of americans then i realized he's by far my favorite character of this movie he's grounded he makes funny jokes and he's very self-aware the actor plays him brilliantly he comes out smelling like a rose like at the end like i thought like at some point they're gonna he's gonna slip up no at the end he does everything right he knows what a good cia agent is supposed to do Exactly. He's much better agent. He's like, okay, here's the plane you want to fly under the radar. Like, this is the path you could take. This is the window that you can operate in. He does everything right. And even, uh, you know, when he first meets Bond, he's keeping like a shitty car, keeping low profile, trying not to be noticed, which is kind of good for a secret agent. Exactly. Well, did Plus, any- he has a sweet tattoo. Oh, yeah. Muffy. Was it, was it Muffy? Yeah, Muffy the yes. Rose. <laughs> Fucking Jack's the best. But did anyone understand the whole Cossack connection and why that was the catalyst for 006 betraying MI6? Like, I didn't get this at all. Yeah, they spelled it out in the movie. Basically, that the Cossacks were, uh, you know, told that the British were going to be on their side and then the British sold them out to the Russians, who then Stalin took them and killed them. Like, it was. Uh, and then, so that made the Cossacks hate the, you know, the British. Uh, I thought they did a pretty good job of explaining that. It was it was rather, you know, it was, it, was, it was a bit expository, but it was okay. Yeah, I think it was clunky the way that they did it. Uh, but I don't know how the hell uh, that MI6 didn't pick up on that while they were vetting their potential agents. But did anybody else pick up Mini Driver in that horrible karaoke scene? Is that is she the le- is she the lead singer in Stand by Your Man? Yeah, she is. And at first I thought maybe okay cuz now we know her as a as a an actress of some cloud. I said, maybe, you know, maybe she's going to play a role in it. No, she just comes and goes. But I saw an interview that she gave with Craig Ferguson on the Late Late Show where she recounts, she talks about the sexual harassment in the movie and even behind the scenes. She recounted a story about one of the, the ADs on set who every day would pat her on the ass while she was filming and say, that's a lovely little bird. And she would look at him and be like, what are you doing? And she said, at that point, on set, it was accepted. So not only was Bond a pig on screen, it appears and behind the scenes, it was also accepted. Classic liberal Hollywood, am I right? Oh, it's a lovely bird. <laughs> well, Bond awakens tied up with Natalia in the helicopter, which has been programmed to self-destruct. They escape but are captured and transported to the Russian military archives where Minister of Defense Dmitry Mishkin interrogates them. Just as Natalia reveals the existence of a second satellite and Oromov's involvement in the Siberian massacre, Oromov arrives and kills Mishkin. Intending to frame Bond for murder, he calls the guards, but Bond and Natalia escape. In the ensuing firefight, Natalia is captured. Bond steals a tank and pursues Oromov through St. Petersburg to Alex's train, where he kills Oromov. Alec then escapes and locks Bond in the train with Natalia, setting it to self-destruct. As Bond cuts to the floor with his laser watch, Natalia triangulates Boris's satellite dish to Cuba, the two escape just in time before the train explodes. 
So typical classic Bond villain. You have a chance to kill Bond. You take it. If anything, you know, in the intelligence community, you'd know. Everybody, hey, whisper, supervillain. If you ever get Bond, kill him. Don't set up some kind of elaborate, overcomplicated attempt to murder him. He's inevitably going to escape. He's inevitably going to escape. And then he's going to come back and kill you. They have him sedated. But yet they insist on strapping him inside of the helicopter and then ripping off Die Hard 2 and forcing him to have some kind of ejector seat save. So several times in this movie, really stupid moves are covered up with the explanation that they wanted to either remove evidence or create evidence. In this case, they wanted to make it look like Bond had the helicopter and therefore he was behind all this, which I don't understand how you would if the helicopter self-destructed and exploded. You might be ruining some of the evidence. At the same time, they explain that they want to ruin the evidence or destroy the evidence at the initial uh, GoldenEye control center, uh, which, again, they, they would fail to do. Most of it was still intact because you used an EMP. So, again, a lot of this stuff just makes no sense at all. I'll tell you one thing that does make sense. His wardrobe. He <laughs> always looks top notch. Yeah, I know it's a Bond staple, but there's like this picture perfect wardrobe that he's got. The shirt's always white and crisp. Like I wear a shirt to work for four hours and it's going to have a little bit of ring around the collar. It's going to have maybe some smudge here. There. It's going to be a little wrinkled. Not this guy. This picture perfect wardrobe should have been put to rest a long time ago. It stopped making sense maybe in the 70s. So after escaping prison, there's the helicopter explosion, there's the tank run, there's a pl- train explosion. His shirt is always perfect, and it extends. There's like a a, a a field around him, so anybody, any of his associates as well. Natalia, her hair and makeup still look okay after all this stuff. It makes no sense. Like, uh, it, it was bothering me. It was distracting me. Is this supposed to be St. Petersburg, where, where they're driving the tank the tank through? Yes. Okay. So, so not Florida. Okay. Russia. <laughs> I was I Russia. was way off. I thought this was so, no. The it seems as if they're just going around the same loop, right? They're just going around the same block because you keep seeing that yellow bridge like every every turn. But can tanks really demolish that? You were in the military, uh, Big D. Can tanks really drive through walls like that? Uh, tanks are pretty durable. You couldn't take this through a a block of cinder block homes, but yeah, it'll easily crush cars. It'll drive through some small. But each time you do it, you're risking throwing a tank tread. But this tank chase. This is where it really started to get me. Bond starts out, he goes through a wall, and he insists in being the driver's position with his head out of the actual tank. He's going to get killed as he drives through these. Later on, he pops down below. Why wouldn't you do that to begin with? But he pulls a typical A-team. You remember in the A-team, they used to, they would blow up a building, and at the last second, you would see people crawling out of the rubble, so we knew that the A-team didn't kill people. Bond runs over four or five police cars, completely pancakes them, only to see people creep out. It was it was yeah. ridiculous. So wait, so we, we, when driving a tank, that is the driver's seat. Where does he normally? Is he normally down below, or does he? Yeah, does, he's, he's, does he pop up like that? Can you drive a tank pop up like that? Yeah, exactly. That's where you do it if you're out. Uh, so you want to actually have some vision if you're driving it in the motor pool or you're actually driving it out where you're not under threat of fire. But yes, traditionally, he would be sitting down lower, almost like Batman in the tumbler. Oh, OK. So he, he would look out and it's a protected position. Bond just wants to show off. He wants people to see his hair and his beautifully tailored suit. He I, wants I, them to know who's doing it. Did you ever drive a tank? Were you able to drive a tank? In uh, no, but I did actually... Uh, was drove one of the armored personnel car, uh, you know, the, I don't know, it's an APC. How, how cool was that? Oh, it was fucking awesome. <laughs> when, when you're when you're in the military and, and you're actually doing training exercises, you have the actual units that are playing their normal role as American forces. And then you also have the OP-4, the, which is the uh, opposition force. The OP-4 can kind of play, you know, with any rules. You don't have to follow the, the normal doctrine and military procedure. So we were playing op four in one of these large maneuvers and we found an APC. They build these large towns that are like full renderings oh, yeah. of cities with shops, there's cars, there's buildings, furniture. So you're playing in an actual urban terrain. We yeah. found an APC that was parked like in a field that had just been sitting there and we actually got it up and running and started driving this APC <laughs> until our, our company commander found us. He laid into us. We shouldn't have been doing it. But to us, it was 
part of the battlefield. But that shit, I'll tell you, was fun. I had no training, and it took me about five minutes to get that thing going. It has two levers. So I've never driven a tank, but uh, when I was living in Ohio, we had the JSMC, the Joint Systems Manufacturing Center, and that's where they build the uh, or retrofit the M1A1 Abrams. And so I had an opportunity to kind of to, to check it out. And yeah, when you're in that thing, you're mostly dependent on instrumentation. You're not, you can't see a whole lot out of it, which is kind of intentional. I mean, it's it's an armored, you know, vehicle uh, that that's meant to shoot over distance, not really uh, for close engagement. So I was kind of surprised as well that they they simplified it so much that it, they basically reduced the tank to like a you know to a, a one man job. Yeah, but one thing a tank is not good at is running stealth. <laughs> Somehow Bond puts this thing in stealth mode and actually manages to sneak up on the whole crew as they get into their snow piercer knockoff train. <laughs> then he obviously turns into maybe Toretto hooked up some Nas. He then is able to not only sneak up, but then actually outrun a train at full speed, is able to go around a mountain, come out the other end of the tunnel, probably two or three miles down the road. I don't know how the hell Russia has not taken over the world. They have some advanced technology when it comes to to armored vehicles. Yeah, to, for reference, uh, the 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 premier tank in the U.S. arsenal, the M1A1, it's got a top speed about forty five miles per hour. Uh, that's a very slow train. Well, I mean, it is carrying the the entire Russian population around the world, and and you have to you have to fight through the different levels. That's a Snowpiercer joke, but there's more techno. <laughs> There's more computer techno babble that's also happening uh, during these scenes. Yeah, I don't know. My cell phone, I, I get almost no signal when I'm in the elevators or the garage in my office building at work. Yet they get full internet service inside of an armored train, inside of a tunnel, after it is derailed and crashed. That's kind of amazing. That's, that's one long telephone line. Gene seems to be the big fan of hacker movies. Did this uh, seem realistic to you at the time? Is this what you expected uh, technology to look like? Oh, no, absolutely not. It, first of all, if any, if any nation's uh, military infrastructure uh, with regards to cyber uh, warfare were this simple to crack and, and this, uh, this basic, we'd be in a lot of trouble. I mean, basically, you're looking at you know passwords <laughs> like arse buns rear and chair that these are not complicated passwords so a single like a single syllable word are you serious i i was pretty sure they were reenacting the the russian hacking of the dnc because you kind of imagine those to be the passwords for the dnc are but, but hold on buns, yeah. rear chair but but again this is a russian password why the fuck is a russian computer hacker named boris using mm -hmm. an english four-letter word yeah all my passwords are in russian yeah, I mean, think about it. Russians aren't going to guess English passwords. Yeah. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bond and Natalia meet Wade in Cuba and borrow his plane where the same night they make love. The next day... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Where they make love? What happened? Just, just the preposterous of it. The preposterousness <laughs> of it. Where they in the fucking villa and they're on the beach. Yeah, I mean, she's just she's just survived multiple insanely <laughs> traumatic on, he, experiences. He didn't even the... read the full block. He, he doesn't need to. First... <laughs> he doesn't need to. She's gone through multiple traumatic experiences. She's not trained for this shit. She's not a special agent. She would be so fucked up in the head. And then she's like, she's like counseling him, and and they're making love in the villa, and they're making jokes with each other. Did you really think? Did, when did you really mean it when you said I didn't matter? And he's like, oh, I was, just, I was calling their bluff. Oh, just kidding. And then she play smothers him with a pillow. It's the fucking weirdest thing. Uh, the next day, while searching for GoldenEye's satellite dish, they are shot down. Anata propels from a helicopter and attacks Bond. After a fight ensues, Bond shoots down the helicopter, which snares Anata and crushes her to death against a tree. Bond and Natalia watch water draining out of a lake, uncovering a satellite dish. They infiltrate the control station, and Bond is captured. Alec reveals his plan to rob the Bank of England before erasing all of its financial records with Goldeneye, concealing the theft and destroying Britain's economy. What's Bond's priorities? I always find myself asking. The fate of the world is at stake. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's doomsday. You know, England can be brought to his knees, but he somehow has the time 
to run a full honeymoon beach paradise montage. They're driving in the convertible, they're giggling, they're flirting. Uh, They seem to address Bond's fear of commitment. I don't know how she knows that much about him yet. And then they have a candlelit, you know, roll in the sheets. Alec, for all I know, could have already been at the satellite and fired the EMP two or three times. But I guess Bond needs to get it off before he saves the world. My question is, how do they get the fucking BMW there? Because this isn't even Cuba yet. This is just some, like, island that was confiscated by the CIA from drug runners and DEAs. It's like a hopper island. But somehow they got the super spy car there. I mean, I believe that they could get it there because this is MI6. Like they could, they, I think it's well within their capabilities. But the question is, why get it there? Like, if you can get it to the island, why not just just drop them off where the plane is? Like, what what the hell is that all about? Because BMW has paid us a lot of money to advertise their brand new convertible. So, getting back to the whole plot that Alec has, though. So Trevelyan is like. He, 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 he spells out, as all Bond villains do, exactly what the plan is, you know. And when you think about it, it makes no sense. Like, I feel like they could have just all laughed at him at that point. Like, what? What? Like, what? that's not going to work? Like, no, of course it's not going to work. <laughs> that's not how banking works. A bank transaction, all it is, is history. If you were to erase the records, you would negate the transfer as wealth. It's literally you would be erasing. It's not like it's not like they punch something in and then there's a guy with like a cart of gold that just walks over and loads it onto a ship. This is literally numbers that are transferring the wealth. What do they call the little trolls in in Harry Potter? Oh, Gringotts. It's Gringotts. The, Gringotts, the, the Gringotts. goblins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's not like you're, you're, he'd be better if he attacked Gringotts gold than he did what he was doing here. If right now Big D wanted to send me money and he did it through PayPal, it's still going to take like three days of verification. It's not just like, boom, instant, done. So you're telling me sharks with lasers wouldn't work? Freaking lasers on the ill-tempered salmon. Okay. There's a lot of things wrong here. Besides the fact that any kind of security they have in their lair doesn't seem to be on. It's like they haven't set the home alarm at their, their house. They shoot down Bond and his Cessna with an anti-aircraft, you know, rocket that's launched from under the water that personal aircraft takes that thing like a champ it acts like it's a bird strike and it goes down right you figure are the alarms going off is the secret base been alerted nope nope not yet they dispatch a helicopter an assault helicopter with on a top there that gets shot down she gets killed but still the base is not on alert what's the point of hiding the base if no one's paying attention wait a minute you're telling me the cuba built a base completely underwater. Like, how are, how were they able to hide? Because uh, CIA operative Jack says, uh, listen, uh, they can't light a cigar without us knowing about it. Are you telling me that the movement of all these materials and this construction and all that wouldn't have raised any kind of alarms to let them know that there's a satellite underwater? You can't build that shit underwater. You have to build it above, then it is lowered hold, into water. Hold on. You're talking about where you could build it? You know yeah. what electronics like the- do not like besides EMPs? They do not like being submerged in water. So yeah. I don't give a shit if you built it out of the water and put it in, built it in, then filled it with water. Either way, <laughs> electronics don't like water and they wouldn't work. I feel like with all these complaints, I got to say something positive. Yes, this is Gene Lyons saying, saying something positive. So mark it on your calendar. Although the setup was quite stupid for Xenia coming out of the helicopter as opposed to just shooting them while they were on the ground and unconscious, her death was inventive. I think after decades of Bond girl deaths, it's really hard to keep coming up with a new one. And hooking her up to a helicopter, shooting the helicopter with an AK, having it fly off course and pull her into a tree where she was poetically crushed just like she crushes other people and then having a witty line at the end. I thought, you know, I'll give them that one. She had an AK-47 on her back. Bond is dazed and disoriented after the crash. Wouldn't it be more logical to shoot him from a safe distance instead of going up and trying to squeeze him? What's going to make her come harder? Then she told also Natalia to wait her turn. Like she's going to get her off next. Hell yeah. Do you think she was orgasming as she was dying? Do you think she like loved, like, do you think, I think she died of orgasm. I think the pain was so pleasurable to her. She gave an orgasm and and passed away in the tree. It wasn't because of anything else. You don't see like any bones breaking. I think she died of an orgasm. She died giving what she loved. As the French would have called it, la petite mort. Yeah. No, I thought it was like Willow casting his spell that just shot him up in the tree. <laughs> Wee! Hey! <laughs> anyway. 
This is it plot point six? <laughs> he's catching. He's getting his shit together. Natalia programs the satellite to initiate atmospheric reentry and destroy itself. As Alec captures Natalia and orders Boris to save the satellite, Boris unwittingly triggers an explosion with Bond's pin grenade received earlier from Q, which allows Bond to escape the antenna cradle. Bond sabotages the antenna, preventing Boris from regaining control of the satellite. Bond and Alec fight on the antenna's suspended platform. Bond releases Alec, who plummets into the radio dish and is subsequently crushed to death by falling debris. Boris survives, but is frozen solid by a cascade of liquid nitrogen. Natalia commandeers a helicopter and rescues Bond. It drops him off into a field where the couple are rescued by Wade and a team of Marines in the movie. So now, I don't know if I missed it. Did we see where he got that grenade pen from? How did how did it come into his possession? Oh yeah, it's 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 down in the queue thing. It's like it's, it's, no, they, no, 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 no. I understand oh. that. I understand that it's Bond's pen, and we're supposed to recognize it. But in all of his fights, his adventures, they have checked him. When they capture him, they frisk him. The pen's not on him. How the hell did Boris get his pen? I think we're just meant to believe that Boris has a fascination with pens. He's always twirling them and stuff. They show several close-ups of him twirling pens. So I think if there's a pen within like 100 yards of him, he's going to get his hands on it. So if you open up his desk, he's got every single pen from the entire office. He probably loses them all the time. God, but what did you guys think of the fight scene? Uh, I my, I wrote down literally in my notes, uh, did anyone care about it? I liked it better when this was uh, the cable guy and uh, Jim Carrey was fighting Matthew Broderick. I didn't think it was too bad. I thought the I thought the you know I've been to Universal Studios where they show you the sound stage and they show you like how they make the sounds for fight scenes and stuff like that. So that's what all I imagined was there was a lot of sounds going on. They were getting thrown into things, punching things. It was fun to see Pierce Brosnan doing a little bit of hand to hand, which was which was kind of cool. And honestly, that was the first time that we got to see him get a little disheveled. So in that, we see this scruffy, somewhat disheveled Pierce Brosnan. I thought he looked much like hotter that way. I kind of see why he was a sex symbol after he got, you know, just just I almost said pounded. After he got, you know, just just beat up a little bit, a little sweaty, had a little scruff going. So it was pretty good. I, I was not turned off by the fight scene, but yeah, it was kind of. I mean, it wasn't the best fight choreography I've ever seen. So now that bomb pen was quite effective. It sets off a cascade of explosions that if you watch carefully, blows up every computer terminal in the entire lair except for Boris's. Well, what what struck me as odd is that even during all of this, in an extremely stressful situation where your entire mission's at stake, he's still typing with one hand while twirling a pen. That would limit him to codes that were only left-handed, which is kind of odd. I mean, but again, there were only one word code, so I guess it was you know, wouldn't take too long. Well, I was never worried about Boris because he's, he's invincible! No, you want to know who's invincible? Sean Bean. How many times do you... Game of Thrones, spoiler alert, he gets it pretty quick. There's no surviving that. Joffrey got him. But here, we're led to believe he's killed multiple times. He falls a good... What do you think that is? 150, 200 feet? Flat on his back? Somehow survives it. But thankfully, a, a flaming, crashing disc will take him. But I'm not even convinced today that he's dead. He may have survived this and will come back in a future Bond film. So speaking of suspect explosions and people who should be dead, Bond at the end there, when he's hanging from the ladder, essentially, at the at the bottom of the uh, the apparatus, you know, at the, at the top of this satellite dish, he's been hanging by like one arm for a pretty long time. Then he goes through a fight. He's been through a pretty long day. Like, I know he's a secret a- agent. But his final escape move is that they bring a helicopter near him and he leaps and grabs onto it and that carries him to safety. Here's the thing. A helicopter has a pretty big rotor that's going to not allow it to get too close to that ladder. So you got like a pretty big area to jump through. And then how does a helicopter stay aloft, right? It's pushing air down. So if you were to jump off a platform, it's going to shoot you straight into the ground. You're not jumping through that, grabbing on. And then... Why did he even have to jump? Why did that platform explode? I don't understand why the, what the explosion was going on up there. When did that happen? It made no sense. I don't think we're supposed to question that. Anytime Bond's around, things explode. It's just crazy. But to cap the movie off, I found it poetic with the way the world is. How, what a simpler time it was that you could have a, a character in a Bond film saying, maybe you two would like to go finish debriefing each other in Guantanamo. In today's world, that has a different connotation. What, what, is it, what does it mean in today's? 
I, I, it sounds like something you might say at a sex club or uh, the last thing somebody in ISIS hears before they're taken off in, in shackles and chains. Are you telling me you never used that word on uh, any of your dates in the 90s? Hey, you want to you wanna go finish this debriefing in Guantanamo? No, I, I, I probably should have. Yeah, yeah. I didn't say it worked. I'm just saying, like, I used it a lot. <laughs> I also found it odd in that scene that you've got essentially like an entire platoon of, of Marine snipers, apparently in ghillie suits, just hanging out all, all right close to each other, which <laughs> makes no tactical sense whatsoever. What were they waiting for exactly? And God forbid some kind of tracked vehicle drives through that area. You could have killed about 30 snipers. My buddy Jack, though, always quick with the quips. Uh, yeah, so that ends the movie. Uh, now's the time where we break out our shat meter and tell you how many wipes this movie would take to get off your butt. Uh, just a refresher if you never listen to shat the movies. Zero wipes is uh, how I imagine uh, the queen mother takes poops. Uh, she just goes and there's no wiping whatsoever. Uh, five wipes is uh, basically the equivalent of, of, of pooping in a... Uh, a gulag or some sort of Soviet base in Siberia. It's going to take a lot to get off because you're you're probably eating nothing but Russian MREs out there. Uh, so zero wipes good, five wipes bad. Big D, how many wipes do you give this movie Goldeneye? Uh, Goldeneye, the video game, easily one wipe. It's fantastic. I want to play it again now. Movie is a 4.5 shit storm. Uh, it was awful. It was misogynistic. It was just bad action it was terrible i had a harder time i think honestly getting through this almost than willow it was really really bad i think triple x might even be better than this no you're crazy gene <laughs> how, how many wipes i'm gonna have to differ from big d here in the sense that i, I think i'm gonna be a little lenient because i just saw willow uh, i'm gonna go three and a half wipes this is the bond we expected in 1995 and it's still, if you had it on and you weren't critiquing it as a critic, you probably wouldn't mind it that much. Uh, you know, again, it was giving people in 1995 more of what they wanted out of the Bond franchise. So I think I, I can forgive it a bit. But it did miss an opportunity where you had a reboot, you had a new Bond, you could have taken Bond in a new direction. And really what they did with Daniel Craig, I, I, I heavily applaud it because it was long overdue. They really should have done that in 1995. So to me, it's a three and a half wiper. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you. I'm also going to give it three and a half wipes. It's not great, but they were trying to bring Bond into you know the mid '90s, uh, and so you saw that with Judy Dench being a strong female character, which you know lasted up through Skyfall. Um, she and so it, it doesn't age well. It shows its age, but it does predict uh, Russian hacking. It does predict uh, the collapse of the world economy. Uh, and uh, and think in the next movie, it predicts Rupert, Rupert Murdoch uh, taking over the news organization. So these these 1990 Bond films were soothsayers. And for that, I'm going to give it three and a half wipes. Also, Famke Janssen is having an orgasm in every scene, uh, even if she's not naked. So three and a half wipes. So that gives us a 3.83 repeated uh, average score. Big D, where does that land on the Shat scale? Uh, this is not at the bottom of the, the septic tank, but it's down towards the bottom. We've done 27, and this puts it right in that 23, 22 range. It is right between Last Starfighter at 3.8 and Blade Runner at 4.0. Oh, no, I think this is a better movie than Last Starfighter. Yeah, it is. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Oh, I thought it's better than Last oh, Starfighter, okay. worse than Blade Runner. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that yeah. feels right. All right, well, next week's movie, Big D, what are they? Thank God. We've had two weeks of garbage and it, it's uh, it's been this, rough this entire pro po podcast is predicated on the thought of garbage no bullshit bullshit we had a couple good weeks there where we had pulp fiction shawshank redemption we had good movies backed up this week we got some good ones coming up here we got movies with a twist from the 90s so we had jacob's ladder the sixth sense the usual suspects and the winner thank god from 99 fight club Oh, this is going to be easy. I'm going to enjoy this movie. This is going to be like the best movie ever. I mean, I think we deserve that though. After these last couple of weeks, I think we deserve. It's going to keep the it's going to keep the family together. Mom and dad are going to stop fighting. We're going to all en uh, just enjoy Fight Club, which is a near perfect movie. I'm going to say it. Yeah, it's zero. It's a zero white movie. In, in, spoiler alert! I'm going to fucking gush all over it, like uh, blood gushes out of Jared Leto's face. So, Raj, when's the last time you saw Fight Club? Oh, I think I see it like every month. Oh, God. His yeah. name was Robert Paulson. 
His name was Robert Paulson. His name was Robert Paulson. I haven't seen Fight Club since it was in theaters, so this will be what? good for me. Are you yeah, kidding I haven't me? Seen, no, I'm that serious. I don't uh, really. I don't rewatch movies unless it's for this podcast. This the, the, uh, listen. If there's uh, there's never a better commentary for what men have become uh, in the in this generation than Fight Club. Fucking great. <laughs> Jesus, it's like Infowars. Go out, come on, spout. Make, to go tell us about the American man being emasculated. Get on your soapbox, Raj. Tell us. Come on, Raj with bitch tits. Me- meanwhile, Raj has IKEA furniture behind him that I can see oh, right now. Oh, I'm totally yeah. I'm, I'm I've got the Klipsch uh, unit right behind me. Yes. <laughs> I- I've got I've actually got a Fomka and yeah. a Jensen. <laughs> Ooh, so that concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're everywhere, including Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram. Follow us at Shat the Movies. We're also on Facebook. Just search for Shat the Movies Podcast. Our website is ShatTheMovies.com, where you can go and vote for all kinds of new movies. You can also give us a, uh, let's say that you want to do like a funny spy theme, right? Uh, write into us. Our email address is hosts at ShatTheMovies.com. We're everywhere. Fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by, please be sure to leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. You can also check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, and soon-to-be Game of Thrones. You can find all the information on ShatOnTV.com. On behalf of my two co-hosts, Big D and Gene Lyons, I'm Roger Roper. Be sure to join us next week for Fight Club. That's it. That's our podcast. Good night and good luck. Don't talk about Fight Club.